The power's been out for three days. Your neighbors are already doing stupid things, burning furniture indoors, drinking puddle water, and somehow convinced that banging pots will bring back electricity. The city's gone quiet, except for the distant sound of generators and screaming. You've got maybe 72 hours before the real chaos starts. And here's the thing nobody tells you. Most people don't die from the disaster. They die from being idiots afterward. No worries, we're fixing that. Mistake number one, trusting your nose to detect carbon monoxide. Step one in not becoming a statistic, stop thinking you're a human gas detector. Your neighbor just dragged his charcoal grill inside because it's cold. In about 20 minutes, he's gonna take the world's most permanent nap and he won't even smell it coming. Carbon monoxide is odorless, colorless, and absolutely does not care about your survival instincts. It binds to your hemoglobin 200 times more effectively than oxygen, which means your blood starts carrying poison instead of the good stuff. You get sleepy, then confused, then dead, in that order. Here's your ghetto CO detector. Grab a candle and keep it burning near your heating source. If the flame starts getting weak or goes out when there's no draft, you've got a problem. The carbon monoxide is stealing oxygen from the combustion. Blow out the candle, open every window, and get outside before your brain decides to shut down permanently. A better method? Find a small mirror or piece of glass. Hold it near your heating source. If it fogs up with a yellowish tint instead of clear condensation, that's incomplete combustion producing CO. Time to evacuate. The science is simple. Complete combustion needs oxygen. When there's not enough air circulation, you get incomplete combustion, which produces carbon monoxide. Your makeshift detector works because the flame and the CO are competing for the same oxygen. If your improvised alarm goes off, congratulations. You just avoided becoming another blackout casualty. If you ignored it, well, at least you won't feel cold anymore. Mistake number two, eating everything in your fridge before it spoils. Day two of the blackout and you're staring at that leftover chicken thinking, better eat this before it goes bad. Wrong. You're about to turn your digestive system into a biological weapon. Food poisoning during a disaster isn't just inconvenient, it's potentially fatal. No hospitals, no IV fluids, no antibiotics. Just you, violent dehydration, and the very real possibility of dying from something that started as, this smells fine. Start by understanding the danger zones. Meat, dairy, and anything with mayo or eggs becomes a bacterial playground after four hours without refrigeration. But here's what they don't teach you. Smell and appearance lie. Salmonella, E. coli, and listeria don't announce themselves with funky odors. Method one for safe eating, the temperature test. Find a thermometer, medical, cooking, doesn't matter. If your fridge interior is above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, everything perishable is now suspect. Toss it. Yes, even that expensive steak. Method two, prioritize by science. Bacteria multiply exponentially in the danger zone between 40 and 140 degrees. Hard cheeses, butter, and condiments can survive longer because of their acidity or salt content. Your survival hierarchy, Eat the most perishable items first, but only if they've been cold for less than four hours. After that, switch to canned goods and dried foods. The real trick? Make jerky. If you've got a gas stove or outdoor heat source, slice meat thin and dry it out. Salt draws out moisture, and heat kills bacteria. If you gamble with spoiled food and lose, you'll spend the next 72 hours wishing the blackout was your biggest problem. Mistake number three, using candles like you're decorating for dinner. Nothing says amateur survivor like burning down your shelter because you thought candles were just medieval flashlights. Every blackout, some genius places a candle near curtains, falls asleep with one burning, or knocks one over while stumbling around in the dark. Fire doesn't care about your emergency. It'll consume your house just as happily during a blackout as any other time except now there's no fire department coming to save you. Start with candle placement science. Heat rises, flames spread upward and outward. Place candles in the center of rooms, away from anything flammable and always in sturdy holders. 
Glass jars work better than decorative ones because they contain the wax if things go sideways. Better method, create candle lanterns. Take a large glass jar, put sand or water in the bottom for stability, then place your candle inside. The glass protects the flame from drafts and contains any wax spillage. If the candle tips, it goes out instead of igniting everything nearby. Here's your reality check. During disasters, response times for emergency services go from minutes to never. That decorative candle arrangement could turn into a crematorium with no one coming to help. If you treat fire like the dangerous tool it is, you'll have light and warmth. If you treat it like ambiance, you'll have a very brief, very bright lesson in thermodynamics. Let's continue with the next two fatal mistakes. Mistake number four, drinking any water that looks clean. The tap stopped working yesterday and you're eyeing that crystal clear puddle outside thinking it looks perfectly safe. Spoiler alert, clear water can still kill you just more slowly and with a lot more intestinal drama. Water treatment plants run on electricity. When the power goes out, so does purification. What's coming out of your tap, if anything, could be a biological disaster zone. So how do you fix it? Method one, boiling. Bring water to a rolling boil for at least one minute. This cooks the microscopic things that want to kill you. The science is simple. Most pathogens can't survive the 212 degree heat. But here's the catch. Boiling doesn't remove chemicals, heavy metals, or radioactive particles. For that, you need filtration. Method two, an improvised filter. Grab a container and layer it from the bottom up. Small stones, coarse sand, fine sand, then a cloth or coffee filter on top. Activated charcoal is a bonus if you can find it. Pour the water through slowly. It's not perfect, but it pulls out sediment and some chemicals. For a more advanced technique, solar disinfection. Fill clear plastic bottles with water and lay them on their side in direct sunlight for six hours. The sun's UV radiation kills pathogens. It's a game changer when you can't make a fire. Look, you can survive weeks without food, but only days without water. Dehydration will get you faster than most waterborne illnesses. So if it's a choice between questionable water and no water, you drink it, but you purify whenever possible. Your priority list for sources, rainwater first, then moving streams, then standing water. If you drink random water because it looks fine, you'll discover that cholera doesn't care about your optimism. Mistake number five, thinking your smartphone is just a dead brick. Your phone died 12 hours ago. You've written it off as useless. Wrong. That dead device is a survival toolkit you're about to throw away. Even without power or a signal, its components can work independently. First, emergency power conservation. Most phones have an ultra power saving mode that kills everything but the essentials. This can stretch your battery from hours to days you need to know where the setting is before your battery is at 1%. Second, signal amplification. No bars doesn't mean your phone is given up. It's still trying to connect. Get to the highest point you can, a rooftop, a hill. Cell towers have backup power, but their range is limited during outages. Height equals a better chance of reception. And remember, text messages require far less power and bandwidth than calls. They'll often get through when a call won't. Advanced technique, use your phone as a signal mirror. The screen, the camera lens, any reflective surface can be used to signal for help. Three flashes in a row, that's the universal distress signal. Aim it at aircraft or distant observers. Your phone has hidden features. The flashlight function can often be activated with a button combination even when the phone won't fully boot. And before a disaster hits, download offline maps, first aid guides, and emergency radio apps. The app store doesn't work in a blackout. If you think your phone is useless when the screen goes dark, you're throwing away tools that could be the difference between rescue and becoming a statistic. Here's the brutal truth about blackout survival. The guides don't tell you this. Most deaths aren't from the initial event. They're from panic, poor decisions, and a basic ignorance of how things actually work when comfortable systems fail. Your neighbors are making fatal mistakes because they're operating on assumptions. They think clear water is safe water. They think dead phones are useless. You know better now. The real survival skill isn't stockpiling supplies. 
it's understanding the science behind staying alive. Physics doesn't care about your emergency. Chemistry doesn't pause for disasters. Biology keeps operating whether the lights are on or off. The power will come back on eventually. The question is whether you'll be there to see it or if you'll just be another cautionary tale about what happens when people confuse hope with a strategy. If you apply this science, you'll survive. If you ignore it, well, at least you won't have to worry about the electric bill.